Good morning again, everybody. Um, I'm Giacomo Pozzi from the China PSME Help Desk. Um, as I said before, today we are going to focus on uh, key intellectual property considerations for collaborating with Chinese partners. Um, we have uh, two special guests, uh, Mr. Valentine de la Corte, our China IP expert, and uh, Ms. Guan Song, Executive Director for the China, Flanders China Chamber of Commerce and the EU China Business Association. Um, so I will now present the China PSME Help Desk in a nutshell, is a project founded by the European uh, Union uh, um, that basically uh, gives a free initial uh, advice to European small medium enterprises and uh, small medium enterprises from the single market program on IP protection uh, in four different jurisdictions, uh, mainland China, Hong Kong, Macau and Taiwan. Uh, so far, we have assisted more than 100,000 SMEs and um, our main service is the helpline. Uh, so as you can see on screen, I really encourage you to send all your IP related questions to our uh, dedicated um, email uh, and you will have a free um, advice within three working days. So uh, besides this uh, service, which is the main one, we, all, we also organize on site and online uh, webinars such as this one, workshops, uh, we also have a service of one-on-one um, -on -one sessions with our in-house uh, IP business advisor. And uh, we also publish uh, guides, uh, fact sheets, uh, self-learning materials in general on our website. We also have an, uh, some IP tools. So I really uh, suggest you to visit us uh, on our website to explore all, all these services. And so these are some of the, the guides and fact sheets that we usually uh, publish that we have uh, free of charge on our website and you can download them in PDF. And they're very convenient because they focus on like a huge variety of industries. Um, well, the help desk, the China PSME help desk is part of a, let's say, a larger family of EU founded projects. Um, that focus on IP protection for different areas of the world, such as Latin America, uh, Africa, Southeast Asia, India, and also, of course, Europe. Um, all of the uh, services of the help desks are free of charge. So I also encourage you to find out more about um, these projects. Um, we also have, of course, social media, so you can follow our activities. You can stay uh, updated with our webinars that we usually organize on uh, LinkedIn, especially. And we also have a YouTube channel where we uh, publish the webinars that we have both in uh, Europe and China. Uh, so you can uh, check them out uh, there. Um, so thank you very much for your attention, and I will leave the floor to Ms. Gwen Song, uh, Executive Director of the Flanders China Chamber of Commerce. And give me one second. Uh, Gwen? You're on mute, sorry, yeah. Yes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Giacomo. On behalf of the Flanders China Chamber of Commerce and the EU China Business Association, I would like to warmly welcome you to our 11th joint webinar with the China IP SME Help Desk. It is very important that companies doing business with China also have an IP strategy included in their China business plan. Doing business with China, as you know, has become more complex. And according to a recent survey of European companies in China, the top three challenges for European companies in China based in China are first, the slowing down of the Chinese economy, but with a growth forecast of 5.4% for 2023, the Chinese economy is performing 
still better than expected. And I wanted also to add that compared to the large economic players, China is still one of the fastest growing economies in the world. The second challenge is the global economic slowdown and thirdly, the geopolitical situation, as you all know. The attractiveness of China as an investment destination varies by sector, and the survey stated that 60% of EU companies mentioned that China remains a top three destination for investment. The EU and China have a daily trade volume exceeding 2 billion euros, making the EU sides each other's second business trading partner. Many of our companies are in China for China, for the size of the market, the local supply chain, and very important, for its innovation power. Innovation is one of the reasons why European companies want to be in China. European companies say it is crucial to do the innovation where the applications are, and for our companies that's in China. They cannot allow not to be close to the customer, and because of that, delay the introduction of new uh, in innovative products. So if our companies want to keep up with the technology of the future, then they must continue to invest in China. Also, the speed of innovation in China is very fast and keeps our companies sharp, as you must know. China is the larger, largest producer of AI research in the world and is lodging more than 60% of AI patents with the World Patent Organization. The World Intellectual Property Organization, the WIPO, just released the Global Innovation Index of 2023 and ranked China as the 12th on the Global Innovation Index, coming from the 14th ranking and Switzerland ranks first. The Global Innovation Index also showed that three Chinese science and technology clusters, first Shenzhen, Hong Kong, Guangzhou, second Beijing, and third Shanghai, Suzhou, were among the world's top five. So being in China shouldn't be really a choice. You must take advantage of the innovation and the local market. Let me now say a few words about the role of the Flanders China Chamber of Commerce, as you can see on the slide. The FCCC is founded by the largest investors from Belgium and China, such as Acheas, Agfa, Baycard, Barco, Picanol, Umicore, KBC Bank. Our aim is to assist companies to enter the Chinese market and Chinese companies to invest in Flanders. We do our activities also in close cooperation with our structural partner, Flanders Investment and Trade. Our aim is to provide information, exchange experience among each other, among the companies, and share our network in China and the EU. We provide a weekly China business newsletter to keep you up to date on China's economy and foreign trade, organize webinars on how to and how not to do business with China, and give expert advice. We also receive high-level Chinese delegations and introduce them to our member companies. We are also in charge of the EU-China Business Association, which is the association of bilateral China business associations in the EU, promoting the economic and trade relations between China and the EU. Today, we represent 20 member associations and represent more than 20,000 European and Chinese companies. And the EUCBA is also an official China partner of the EU SME Center based in Beijing. The EU SME Center is a European Union initiative that provides a comprehensive range of hands-on support services to European SMEs, getting them ready to do business in China. Their team of experts provides advice and support in four areas from business support, law, standards and conformity and HR. From first-line advice to in-depth technical institutions, they offer services through knowledge, advice, training and advoc advocacy. So I would like to end here and give the floor to Mr. Giacomo Pozzi, IP Help Desk, so that we can start to listen to Mr. Valentin de Lacour, who is also a member of the, Val of the Flanders China Chamber of Commerce and IP expert of the China IP SME Help Desk, 
who will give or deliver a training on the IP considerations to collaborate with Chinese partners. I would just also like to add that this week on 15 December, we also have a webinar with the European Union Chamber of Commerce in China, together with Mr. Adam Dunnett, the Secretary General, who will present the EUCC position papers 2023-2024 in China. So welcome. You can join us via our website, www.flanderschina.be. Thank you. I would now like to give the floor back to Mr. Giacomo Pozzi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gwen. Okay. So uh, now I invite uh, Mr. Valentine to take the floor and uh, then, yeah. So he can start his uh, presentation on key intellectual property considerations for collaborating with Chinese partners. Thank you, Giacomo. Uh, can, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, well, uh, hello, everyone. And uh, well, thank you very much for being here. I'm very happy uh, to, um, well, to give a talk on IP and China in collaboration with Chinese partners. Um, very quickly, a word on myself. So my name is Valentin Delecourt. I'm a Belgian qualified lawyer. I've been active in the IMP field for close to 20 years now, including in China. I used to live and work uh, in China. I was based in Shanghai for uh, for several years, working for a Chinese IP boutique, where I was basically, well, helping and providing legal support to European SMEs, mainly in European businesses, uh, for all their IP issues when dealing with China. I did a lot of transactional litigation, IP portfolio building. Um, today, I work at Osborne Clark. Osborne Clark is a, an international legal practice, very much centered on the European market, but we're also present in China. We have an office in Shanghai. And today, I would say that my practice has evolved and I'm doing more transactional work, uh, which, which has become my key focus uh, when, it comes to, uh, when it comes to China. The topic of today, as you all know, well, key IP consideration for collaborating with Chinese partners. The idea is to, well, provide you with some tips, some tools in order to be prepared when you're meeting uh, initially with potential Chinese business partners, when you want to exhibit your products, technologies at trade fairs located in China. Um, just be aware that the audience today is is quite diverse, and I have taken the um, I've made the, the decision to use this topic to basically provide quite basic information on IP and how to be prepared when when dealing with uh, with Chinese business partners. So I fear that people with a legal background and IP background will probably not learn that much. Uh, this this seminar is is really targeted to SMEs that do not have necessarily in-house legal or IP capacities. So to start with, uh, a few words on, well, the importance of intangibles in uh, today's economy. Just a quick reminder, but I think that is especially relevant when it comes to, to dealing with China. First thing, uh, probably are aware of this, but intangible assets have become absolutely key in today's economy. When you look at this graph, well, you can see that in 75, intangible assets constituted 17% of the corporate value of S&P 500 companies. 45 years later, 2020, the portion of the value of, of the corporate value that is made out of intangible assets has grown to 90%. So what does this mean? Well, it means that today what gives value to your business is really what distinguishes you from others. It can be your brand identity, but it's very often your capacity to innovate and your capacity to control, to appropriate, to monetize the result of your innovation. And how do you do that? Well, you have two very important tools to do so, legal tools, which are intellectual property rights and trade secrets. They're very often associated, but it's important to understand that they're not the same. I will come back to this uh, to this difference. 
But so intangible assets have become key and you do protect them by using the IP system and, and, and the trade secrets uh, regime. So, uh, well, today IP is extensively used by the largest companies in the world. Here, small extracts of an article published on the website of the World Intellectual Property Organization that stresses really the fact that it's intangibles and IP have become the most important asset of the world's largest and most powerful company. It's really the foundation for their market dominance and continuing profitability. And, and so this is really why large companies, while well, they massively invest in developing their IP strategy, in building relevant IP portfolios, um, really to protect their competitive advantage on, on the markets where they are active. And I think this reflects, obviously, the importance of IP for big businesses and, and the importance of in, investing in IP. But it's also why today, well, um, many partnerships, many investments are really IP driven. It's because IP is basically uh, the most important assets of many businesses today. Now, OK, big companies invest in, in IP, but why? Should the European SME care about IP and invest to protect its intangible assets? Well, I have listed here several reasons, justifications to massively invest in your IP. I think these reasons are valid basically anywhere. They're valid for Belgium, for Europe, for the US, but they are especially relevant when it comes to dealing with China. First reason, well, IP is there to help you protect your competitive advantage. How? Well, basically by granting exclusive rights. And IP rights enables you to have a monopoly on the object of your rights. Technical invention, uh, a, a trademark to protect your brand identity. And basically the exclusive right is the possibility to exclude others from exploiting your right, the object of your right, without your authorization. So you have a monopoly which enables you to control basically the exploitation of your intangible assets and to make money out of it. Second, very important reason why you should invest in your IP is to attract investments. And this is very often an absolute must for Chinese investors. And this has been true for, for a long time. I remember 10 years ago, attending uh, um, a, a VC round table in Shanghai, Stuart it was in the healthcare sector, so very much IP driven sector. But all the VCs agreed, we don't put a cent in a company if there is no IP, and we don't put a cent in a company if there is no good IP. So really, having a sound IP strategy will be key to attract investors, especially uh, or also when uh, they are based in China, and there's a lot of money in China to be invested in relevant businesses. Third good reason, FTO, which stands for freedom to operate. Uh, basically, when you enter a new market, when you want to commercialize your technology, your products on a new market, well, you need to pay attention not to infringe the IP rights of third parties. So you have to do a, a check of this. It's called the, the, the freedom to operate. And having a sound IP strategy, building a relevant IP a portfolio in the markets where you want to be present can significantly reduce the risks which are linked to the commercialization of, of your products and, and, and reduce the risks basically uh, posed by the IP portfolios that have been developed by third parties. And as we will see later in my presentation, well, Chinese businesses are massive filers of IP rights. They have built over the last years very important IP portfolios. And so I think it's it's very important before doing business in China to check what IP rights are around to avoid the risk of being sued for IP infringement. A fourth reason, which is very important when it comes to China, is that having a sound IP strategy and building a relevant IP uh, portfolio will increase your control when you outsource. If you want to outsource manufacturing, sourcing, developing uh, your supply chain and including China within your supply chain, with, which is very often the case nowadays, well, it's important 
to have a good IP portfolio to do so. Let's take the example of an IoT solution. You have a hardware component and a very complex technology component you want to have manufactured in China. Well, you will have to find a Chinese manufacturer and transfer some important relevant information to him so that he is able to build that complex technology component. How will you protect your um well your 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 intangibles here? Well, first you will have to find a good and reliable partner. Uh, that's a very important way to protect your IP. Second, you will need to have good contracts that you will need to negotiate in great detail, extremely important to protect your IP. And third, well, you need to have a good IP portfolio to give you increased control when you share information with a potential manufacturer um, to, 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 to ensure, well, that he doesn't start, for example, manufacturing your equipment for your competitors. A fifth reason is uh, tax purposes. I will not even elaborate, that's more local. For example, in Belgium, we have a very interesting tax regime uh, where you can benefit from, from interesting tax rates on revenues generated by IP that has been developed in, in Belgium. You have that in many different European countries. And then last but not least, IP is important when you want to enter new markets. It will make your company more attractive to develop partnerships. It will help you secure your position on you on a new market. And again, that's especially true when it comes to China. Let's take the example of Chinese joint venture. You want to set up a company with the Chinese partners to enter and develop your business on the Chinese markets. Well, good luck to find a, a, a Chinese partner that will want to invest and team up with you if you do not have a sound IP strategy and an IP portfolio, which is tailor-made and targeting China. It's basically uh, difficult or, or, or impossible and, and basically your business will fail if, if, if you do not have that. So very important to have IP in mind when you internationalize, very important to have IP in mind to succeed on the Chinese market. Now, a few facts and figures on the importance of IP for, for, for China's economy. I think it, it's, it's interesting to, to, uh, to have a few facts and figures in mind. First thing, when it comes to China and IP, it's obviously the evolution. Uh, there was no IP 45 years ago when the country decided to open up to the outside world at the end of the 70s. And today, 2023, well, IP has become a top national priority. What does this mean? Well, practically, this means that nowadays in China, you have a complete set of Chinese IP laws that are in place. And this uh, translates especially, and it's, it's really characterized by a very intense legislative dynamism. If you take the period 2017 to 2021, all the major IP laws were amended. The fourth amendment of the Chinese patent law entered into effect in 2021. The trademark law nowadays is once again under revision. And basically this shows well that the Chinese authorities are constantly adapting the Chinese IP system to fit the very rapidly and, and, and evolving and changing um, changing uh, economy. And, and they obviously are adopting the Chinese system to fit the interests of their companies of Chinese businesses. Very important to understand that IP has become really a central part of China's development strategy. China has the ambition to become an IPR powerhouse. They have released a 15-year plan to really develop the IP system uh, in, in, in the years to come, and they're actively working on this. Second thing, uh, important to understand that China is a massive user of the IP system. If you take, uh, well, patent applications, well, China is the number one country in the world with, when it comes to the number of domestic patent applications. 2015, more than a million patent applications were filed with the Chinese IP office. Huge number. China makes the headlines. Uh, is this a sign of, of a truly innovative economy or is this the result of incentives that are provided and put in place by the Chinese authorities to promote patent filings? Well, 
obviously the 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 the, the reality lied a bit in the middle. But I think that's, that nowadays, while Chinese companies continue to massively file, 2021, more than a million and a half in pension patents files, domestic filings, so, so filings by China-based companies, accounted for 90%. So it's really a sign that Chinese companies are massively filing and protecting their technical innovations with the patent system. What is important to understand today is that there is a clear shift from quantity to quality. And so you have more and more uh, good quality patents that are filed by Chinese businesses. They use, they rely less on the util utility model system. I will come back to, to what a utility model is. There is a reduction in patent subsidies. Basically, China businesses are aware of the importance of IP. They are using it and they are protecting more and more reliable uh, innovations. Third, internationalization. Chinese companies also massively file abroad. If you take the PCT applications, PCT system is basically a way to apply for patent protection uh, through one single application, and then you, 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 you can apply in almost any country in the world. And China is a massive user of the PCT uh, of the PCC, PCT system. It's true for Chinese businesses, Chinese universities, even Chinese governments. Um, the Chinese government sector is using the PCT system. It's an obvious obvious sign of the increased internationalization of the country and its businesses. And Huawei was a, was the top PCT applicant in 2021. The state of innovation, well, Gwen uh, very rightfully pointed uh, and, and highlighted the fact that China has become a very strong and important player when it comes to innovation. If you look at R&D spending, it has massively grown over the last 20, 25 years. Uh, increased um, investments in R&D uh, every year, while if you take the US, for example, it has stagnated. So. Well, it's expected that China will at some point and probably fairly soon um, pass the US when it comes to R&D uh, R spending. What does this mean? Well, obviously, it's a sign of how important innovation has become for the country. But how do you protect your innovation by using IP? And so with a country and an economy that is so much based and relying on innovation, well, obviously, you need to have uh, uh, an IP system that matches this reality. And so it means that, well, it's 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 another explanation of, of why China has invested so much in adapting its IP system. And, and so now, they, well, as I already said, we have a strong, reliable and quite sophisticated IP system that has been put in place uh, in China. So key learning of this is that IP has become essential for Chinese businesses. Uh, um, all innovative Chinese IP businesses are IP aware, they are IP rich, they have perfectly understood that IP is there to protect their competitive advantage, that IP is there to help them create value, to increase their competitiveness, to support their growth. And so it's important to be aware of this because Chinese businesses have become, what I would say, very strong IP competitors. Uh, and this has an impact on foreign businesses. This has an impact on foreign businesses that want to be active on the Chinese markets because you will face increased competition on the IP field from your local competition. What does this mean? For example, diff more difficulties in having your IP protected and your IP registered, but also more risks to be the target of litigation. There's a lot of IP litigation going on, and there are more and more IP litigation that are filed by Chinese-based companies against their foreign competitors. I think it's important to be aware of that, to be prepared, to understand how the, the, the Chinese IP litigation system works, to anticipate, and this requires, once again, to be ready, to be prepared, to be proactive, and to have a strategy. Now, how do you protect your IP when, when you meet potential new partners or doing trade uh, or during trade fairs? So that's 
the topic of today's webinar. Well, the first thing, and, and you will not be surprised, the first thing is that you need to plan ahead. Uh, if you want to protect your IP, well, you need to be prepared. And you, need, you need to be prepared before meeting a partner and before attending a trade fair. First thing that you should do, uh, and this applies for, for many jurisdictions, and it, it's, it's a basic advice when it comes to IP, is that you need to know what you will have to protect. And so it's very important to have a clear view of your IP needs and of your IP assets. And basically, intangible assets are non-physical, so they're difficult to identify. And very often, SMEs lack an overview of their IP assets. I, I, this, I see this on a, on a daily basis. Smaller companies that are less savvy uh, legally and, and, and on the IP, uh, IP level well, do not have a clear overview of their IP assets. And so the first thing to do is to conduct an IP audit and to map your IP assets, to have basically a comprehensive overview of what you have, what IP you have to protect, to protect your products, to protect your technology. And you need to understand if you're well protected. So you need to ascertain the legal status, the territorial coverage, the value, the risks that are related to your IP assets. And this is important to do in order to understand what IP assets are essential to achieve your business goals. So very important, first thing, understand what to protect and understand how to protect it. And this should be done before going to China, before contacting and meeting with any possible Chinese partner. Now understand how to protect your competitive advantage. Once you have done your audit, you have mapped your IP sets. Well, you need to understand where you have holes in your uh, in your protection, and so you need to understand how to protect your competitive advantage. And basically, I already mentioned this. You have two types of rights that you can use to protect your innovation. You have intellectual property rights, and you have trade secrets. And these work differently. What's an IP right? I mentioned it already. It's an exclusive right. So it's a monopoly. You can exclude others from exploiting your IP without your authorization. Now, very important to understand is that you have different types of IP rights, and every IP right will serve a different goal. So trademarks will protect the indication of origin of your goods and services. Patents will protect technical features of your products, your processes. Designs will protect the external aspect of your products. Copyright will protect creative works. It's a very broad notion, and it includes softwares, uh, for example, softwares. Now, very important is to create a bundle of rights. Uh, very often, I see SMEs that focus on one type of IP right. They believe they have an IP strategy because they have found a patent, but they didn't pay attention to designs. They didn't pay much attention to their trademarks. That's not a good way of doing. You really need to have a comprehensive understanding of different IP rights that are available and to use them in obviously a cost efficient and strategic way. So keep in mind, create a bundle of rights. The more rights you have, the better you will be equipped to face challenging situations you may encounter on the Chinese market. Second type of rights, the trade secrets. Now, trade secrets does not grant you an exclusive right. It doesn't give you a monopoly. Trade secrets is basically the protection of specific confidential information. And so it's a protection that is based on the nature of the information, must among other things be confidential, secrets, and the way the information is handled by the holder. I will come back to this, but to protect your trade secrets, you need to proactively protect the secrecy of the information. And that's very important. For example, when you will meet a Chinese partner for the first time, will you, when you will exhibit your products on a trade fair, you need to proactively protect the secrecy of your valuable confidential information. Step three extremely important, keep this slide uh, in mind, is that you need to have enforceable IP rights. And this requires to be proactive. First thing that you should know when it comes to IP is that an IP right is 
a territorial right. So if you're protected in Belgium and the US, for example, you're not necessarily protected in China. So when you devise your IP strategy and your China strategy, you need to make sure that your IP portfolio covers the Chinese markets. So even if you do not want to be active in China, but you want to have components manufactured in China, or you want to exhibit your products at, at important Chinese trade fairs, well, make sure that China is part of your territorial coverage of your IP portfolio. Second, always keep in mind that registration is needed. IP rights protection is not an automatic protection. You have an exception, which are copyrights, but basically keep in mind, you need to register to be protected. So you need to proactively apply for protection in China, go through a, a registration procedure and eventually obtain your IP rights. And keep in mind that if you do not apply in China, well, then your IP can be freely used. Uh, and so it's like giving a free license to use your inventions, your trademarks, your designs to your Chinese competitors, which is something that you most likely want to avoid. So be proactive, take China into account when you build your IP right portfolio. Very important, obviously, is to adapt to the specificities of the Chinese IP system. Uh, and so, well, basically work with people that are experienced and that master the system. Step four, um, very important, is to use contracts to protect your IP. So it's all well and good to register your IP rights, to build your IP portfolio. And if you deal with Chinese partner, well, you will have to have strong contracts that organize your collaboration on many different levels, including when it comes to IP and the protection of your confidential information. So pay great attention to your IP and your confidentiality clauses. Negotiate your contract in great details. That's extremely important. Uh, in my experience, when you, for example, you have to sign an NDA 10 years ago, it was very difficult to obtain a good NDA from a Chinese company. Well, nowadays, when you receive NDAs from Chinese companies that are a bit savvy and, and, and IP focused, these are highly, uh, uh, very good quality. So you, you will also, you should also see from reliable partners that they are IP focused, they understand the value of IP and they agree on having complex and sophisticated IP clauses in their contracts. Now, very important, uh, and, 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 and this may sound common sense, but it is important to have contracts that are enforceable in China. And all too often, I still see today, Belgian companies or European SMEs that fight to have, for example, their local laws applicable to the contract, to have their local jurisdiction mentioned as you know, the form for litigation in case of problem. And very often that is a mistake uh, because it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to enforce a foreign decision in China. So always better either to go for arbitration and to select the right forum for arbitration or to designate Chinese courts in the contra as being competent, because it will make it way more easy to enforce your contract, to enforce your IP in China than doing it elsewhere and then having to enforce a foreign decision in China, which is almost certainly likely to fail. So important to negotiate your contract in great details, take into account the Chinese specificities, and we very often go for Chinese law that are either mandatory, so you have no choice. For example, in terms of tech transfer, you have plenty of mandatory legal provisions. But just to enforce your contracts, uh, having Chinese law and, 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 and a China form will very often make, uh, make sense. Now, when it comes to um, meeting a Chinese partner for the first time, well, obviously important to sign an NDA before disclosing anything of value. And the A, which you probably know, stands for non-disclosure agreement. So it's a specific contract to protect the confidentiality of any information that can be exchanged with a Chinese partner. So what actions to take to protect your IP before meeting a possible partner or before attending a trade fair? Well, first of all, know your IP, understand what you have to protect and how you have to protect it. Keep in mind to create a bundle of rights. Do not limit yourself to one type of IP right. Use the full spectrum 
of IP rights available, obviously in a cost-efficient and strategic way. Have enforceable IP rights. Remember that an IP right is a territorial right. You need to apply for protection and you need to apply for protection in China. And last but not least, use an enforceable contract. These are high level, but extremely important principles if you want to protect your IP when it comes to, uh, to doing business in China, to dealing with Chinese partners. Um, well, let's focus now quickly on patents and trade secrets in China. Uh, I think these are the two most relevant rights when it comes to protecting uh, technology and technical uh, innovations. Chinese patents in a nutshell, first thing, and maybe remember only this, in China, you have two types of patents. You have invention patents. These are basically the classic patents, for example, that we find in Belgian law. And then you have utility models. Utility models are kind of, of smaller patents. They're influenced and, and, and yeah, influenced by German law, where you also have uh, utility models. Now, an invention patent will cover a technical innovation uh, that can cover a product, a process, or a combination of both. Utility models can only use, only be used to cover products, and so cover technical solutions to technical problems related to products, not to processes. Three conditions for patent protection, exactly the same as in Europe and in Belgium. Novelty, inventiveness, practical use. Don't have really the time to elaborate, but basically keep in mind that to be protected by a patent, your invention must remain confidential until the day that you apply for patent protection. So do not disclose during an initial meeting on a trade fair any information that would lead to a patented invention, because if you would disclose it, well, you won't be able to patent anymore in China, in Belgium, anywhere in the world, basically. Patent rights are granted for a limited term. An invention patent will be granted for 20 years as from the filing date, while a utility model is only protected for 10 years as from the filing date. And once the patent or the utility model are granted, well, you have an exclusive right. So the right to exclude others from manufacturing, using, offering to sell, selling, importing the patent product. You can prohibit others from using your patented process or a product directly obtained by the patented process without your authorization. So that is the whole idea of IP, the whole idea of a patent, have an exclusive right, having a monopoly. Few words on the Chinese utility model, which I believe is, is, is an interest, interesting feature of the Chinese IP system. Utility models, as I said, can only cover products. They also cover smaller technical improvements. What's interesting is that the inventiveness level is lower than for an invention patent. So maybe an invention cannot be patented through an invention patent, but will be accepted for, for utility model protection. So keep that in mind. What is very interesting with a utility model is that there is no substantive examination. So the Chinese patent office will not check if the patent meets all the patentability requirements. This means that to obtain a utility model, well, it's way faster. Within six to 12 months, you have an enforceable right. Uh, it's way cheaper because you don't have the whole complex registration procedure you will have for an invention patent. And so basically keep in mind that the utility model is easy, is cheap, and is quick to obtain. And so you definitely should take advantage of Chinese utility models. And it's interesting to look at the numbers. If you look here at statistics from 2020, you can see that the ratio between foreign companies and Chinese companies that file invention patents is one to nine. For one foreign-owned Chinese patent, you have nine um, Chinese-owned foreign uh, Chinese patents. If you look at the utility models, you can see that the ratio is 1 to 382. What does it mean? Well, basically that Chinese businesses massively use the utility model and that the foreign business do not do it. And that's a mistake. Uh, Chinese utility models are massively underused by foreign companies because it's very often misunderstood uh, and 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 
again, it's it's a mistake. Understand how Chinese businesses use the Chinese IP system to their advantage and, and basically do the same to protect your, uh, your competitive advantage. Trade secrets, uh, very quickly. Um, well, trade secrets, as I mentioned already, are different types of rights. What can be protected? Well, what is interesting with trade secrets is that uh, a, a, a very broad range of information can be protected. Patents only protect inventions, so technical solution to a technical problem. A trade secret can basically protect any type of information, technical, commercial, operational, strategic, financial, all these information can be protected, provided that you can prove that the information meets three requirements. The information must be secret, must be not known to the public, confidential. It must have commercial value because it is secret. The information must have commercial value. And as I mentioned already, you need to proactively protect the confidentiality of the information. So you need to adopt reasonable steps to keep the information secrets. And what is interesting is that these three requirements, well, you find them in Europe, in the Trade Secret Directive. All the countries of the EU now have a, de a definition of trade secrets that includes these exact same three requirements. In the US, again, exactly the same. You will benefit from the US trade secret regime if the information is secret, has commercial value, and, is, and, and, and you proactively protected the confidentiality of information. So it, it's really worth investing in building a relevant IP uh, trade secret portfolio at home by implementing a good, um, a good uh, trade secret protection uh, strategy because it will be useful for Europe, but also for the US and also eventually for China. Be aware that the, the Chinese anti unfair competition law, the main body of law to protect trade secret was amended twice in 2017 and 2019, basically with the aim to strengthen the trade secret protection regime. More information may qualify as a trade secret, more acts will qualify as being illicit, as being misappropriation, and more people may be held liable. So basically, better trade secret protection regime in China. Very important when it comes to trade secrets is a reasonable steps requirement. So you need to adopt secret keeping measures. If you do not do so, well, then the information will not qualify as a trade secret. It will be considered as being part of the public domain and anyone can use it. So very important. Again, I insist to proactively protect the secrecy of your information. Signing an NDA is a good start, but it is not sufficient. Now, what is interesting in China is that you have an interpretation by the Supreme People's Court that basically provide guidance of the types of measures that you should adopt to protect the confidentiality of your information. Um, you will receive the slides. These measures are mentioned here, but basically use contracts like NDAs, train your people and implement regulations within your organization to protect confidentiality. Um, implement access control. Access management is, is highly important when it comes to confidentiality protection. Have good cyber and IT measures in place. HR management is hugely important. The biggest risks when it comes to trade secrets are employees, people close to the business, so very often employees, ex-employees, but also business partners. And so this is why it is important when you meet initial business partners to have these, um, well, these set of, of, of protection measures in place. And again, I insist having an NDA is important, but it is not sufficient. So basically to protect your trade secret, well, Again, you need to be proactive and it's not automatic. You need to protect them. Um, you should do an audit and improve the protection measures that are in place. Again, having an NDA is a good start, but it's not enough. Document all transfers of your confidentiality measures. That's very important. Once you sign an NDA with, an, with a business partner, you need to keep track of all the confidential information that you share and that is governed by this NDA. If, if you do not do this, you will never be able to prove that specific information came from you and was disclosed in the context of discussions under an NDA. And so your NDA will be worthless. 
So very important to have an NDA, but very important to keep track of all the information you share with a potential partner to be protected. Be aware that the regime has improved in China to protect trade secret, but enforcement remains challenging. And so again, very important to document, document, and document any information you share to be able to prove it and, and, and be protected. Why patents? Why, uh, why, why going for trade secrets? Well, don't have the time to elaborate. You, 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 you will read this on the slides, but basically, this needs to be carefully thought. Should I go for patent protection? Should I keep an invention? Uh, secrets, uh, both can work, both can be relevant, but you need to, 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 to give careful consideration to this. So trade secrets patent, hugely important, but don't forget your other IP rights and especially your trademarks. Um, really, when it comes to China, it's better to register sooner than later. And definitely you should register your trademarks before engaging with Chinese partners. Why is that? Well, because China is a first to file country, which means that the first company or individual that registers a trademark will be the valid owner of the trademark. And, and it's the same in Belgium, by the way, in the Benelux and in Europe. But in China, it has given rise to a practice which is called the trademark hijacking, where basically Chinese individuals, businesses will register trademarks owned outside of China by foreign businesses. And then the day that you want to go to China, well, you will be infringing this trademark that has been filed by a third party. Trademark uh, hijacking is basically a bad faith filing, has been a huge problem in China. Chinese law have been evolving to limit, um, to limit this practice and the latest draft amendments of the Chinese trademark law that is under discussion uh, today uh, contain several provisions to really make it more difficult to file trademarks in bad faiths, but still prevention, pre prevention is better than cure. It's easy to apply for trademark registration, so do it. Do not wait that someone else does it for you because you will run into trouble, that is for sure. So a last slide to... Uh, make a short recap on how to protect your IP and trade secrets when meeting with potential partners. Well, as you will have understood, execute an NDA. That is absolutely key to protect the confidentiality of your know-how of your trade secrets when you disclose them to a potential partner. But keep in mind that other confidentiality measures should be used. Used, for example, confidential marking, oppose confidential on any documents that you share with your Chinese partner provided obviously that this document contains confidential information. Second, very important, organize what you share, disclose only what is needed. So always ask yourself, how much of my IP should I disclose? This is true when you meet partners, this is true when you exhibit on a trade fair, uh, no need to disclose too much. So review and consider what you will be disclosing and pay careful consideration to this and avoid, obviously, novelty-destroying publications that can, down the line, well, prevent you to obtain patent protections or filing for, for, for design protection. Um, perform background checks. That's very important. I mentioned it already, but it's key to protect your IP and to succeed on the Chinese market is to work with reliable partners. So select your targets, select your leads, and only work with people uh, with whom it makes sense that are complementary to you and that will benefit your, your, your business. But very important to, 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 again, collect sufficient information on a potential partner, plenty of ways to do so, uh, do it and invest time and money in, in performing your background checks if you, if you want to go further with some money. And last but not least, work carefully follow up and monitor. And if problems, IP issues are detected, well, you should react. So to conclude, um, key IP considerations for collaborating with Chinese partner, and especially when uh, meeting new potential partners or exhibiting at trade fairs, well, first be proactive and have a tailor-made China IP strategy. Um, as I hopefully made it clear, you should start early, plan ahead and anticipate, so have a strategy. You should know your IP, remember, perform an audit, map your IP assets, 
understand what is protected, what is not, and what should be protected, and take action. So build a relevant IMP portfolio, register and layer your IP, create a bundle of rights, do not limit yourself to one single type of rights, pay attention to trade secrets, remember that protection is not automatic, you need to take reasonable steps to protect the confidentiality of information, have NDAs, label the information, inform uh, your employees of the confidential nature, uh, etc. Negotiate your contracts in great detail, extremely important, and have enforceable contracts. So pay attention to this and uh, don't forget your trademarks. I insist, sign in the A's, mentioned already, organize what you share. So select what you disclose and evidence what is shared, track every single confidential information that is disclosed. And last but not least, well, select your leads and perform background checks, basically vet your partners. It's common sense, but it's highly important when it comes to China. And you do have several tools available to collect reliable information on, um, well, on whom you may be doing business. So that's it. I've been a bit longer than expected, so not much time for Q&A. But uh, if there are one or two questions, I'm, I'm happy to, um, to take them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valentine, for your uh, great presentation. So uh, we already received a question, and I also encourage the audience to uh, write the other uh, questions in the uh, chat box. Uh, so um, we have a question from Mr. Dumont. Um, are they also aligning, I guess, Chinese, uh, China, their IP laws with international law or the way around influencing the international law? Well, but both both actually, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, China today uh, is, is part of the world IP order. They're part to all the main IP treaties and agreements. China is a member of the WIPO for many, many years, decades. So um, basically, the, the 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 set of IP laws that has been put in place is a direct result of all the the international IP treaties and agreements to which China is a part of. Uh, are they today influencing the the um, the the IP system on a global level? Uh, they probably do. They have in, the intention to. It, it may take some some years, but they have been uh, pretty innovative uh, on issues like uh, AI. Uh, should AI be recognized as an, an author, an inventor? Well, they, they are taking their own way. Uh, other jurisdictions are taking another, but eventually you have an influence. They definitely have an influence when it comes to standard essential patents, very specific um, type of patents where you have case though that has have an impact on, on, on the global stage. So I would say that uh, both definitely it's a product and the results of international IP uh, agreements and, and and conventions, but today they, they are developing their own IP system that that also influence has an influence and impacts the, the global IP system. Uh, great. Um, if somebody wants to ask some more questions, maybe related to maybe some specific IPs, uh, feel free to right uh, in the chat box. We also uh, want to remember uh, the audience that on uh, Thursday 14th of December and on Friday 15th of December uh, we are available, the China P SME Help Desk, uh, to provide free of charge one-on-one uh, -on -one business um, uh, consultation uh, IP business consultation sessions with our uh, in-house IP uh, advisor. So I will send in the chat box now the link to register uh, to this uh, private meeting. Uh, our meetings are 30 minutes long and they are free of charge. You can always um, uh, book a meeting whenever you want. There is no limit. Uh, so I really encourage you to take advantage of uh, this uh, opportunity. Yeah, and I'm also available if you have any question. My my email is on the slide, so don't hesitate to uh, 
to drop me a line. I'll be happy to um, to take contact and, 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 and discuss. So we have also another question um, about the Madrid system. So how does it exactly look for China considering they have subclasses in trademarks? Yeah, true. So, um, well, China is, is part of the Madrid system, so you can use it to be um, to be protected in China. But it's important to be aware of the subclass system, so to anticipate. And so you should also be aware of that when 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 you file. Um, when you file locally, if you want to use the Madrid system, well, anticipate and, and, and be informed on the on the subclass system. Which is uh, which is important. Madrid system can be cheaper, but can be longer to obtain trademarks. Can lead to more difficulties. So there's an assessment to be made. Uh, there's no yes or no answer to should I use it. It depends. Depends on the context, the sector, the types of marks you want to register. Uh, but basically, be aware that the Madrid system is available when it comes to China. But ideally, take into consideration the subclass system from the start. Uh, great. So we have another question. Does uh, Mr. Delacourt uh, have experience with plant breeder right related IP, uh, PBR? Um, enforcing PBR seems especially hard in China. Yeah. Well, to be honest, I never had to um, to handle uh, to handle such case. Uh, I do have a network of of businesses with or service providers. Um, that are more expert in this type of uh, specific type of rights. So um, unfortunately, no specific um, strategic issues to 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 recommend based on experience. But I would love to 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 support any any company with uh, developing that or enforcing these kind of rights uh, in China. So can always take contact, and if there's an interest, happy to collaborate. Um, great. Basically, basically I, I, I for this type of work, I always work with local partners I have in China. Uh, it's important to have this combination of myself with the China expertise and, and obviously EU uh, EU expertise, and then a selection of, of of good Chinese partners I have on the ground that I know that I trust, with whom I used to work, um, and 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 this combination usually. Um, provides good value to clients that are that are happy but happy to to discuss in private. Great, we have other two questions. Thank you very much for being so active. So, if I find that my IP rights have been violated in China, what is the procedure for filing a claim? Well, that that depends. Uh, first, you need to make sure that you are protected in China. For example, if you did not register your trademark or did not apply for patent protection, then, as I mentioned, it's like giving a free license to use your IP. You will not be protected, and your invention or your trademark will be in the public domain. That means that anyone can validly and legally use it in China. So the first thing you will need to assess Am I protected? Yes or no? Do I have the relevant IP rights that gives me the exclusive right I was talking about that give me the rights to exclude a Chinese company from exploiting my IP? That's the first step. Once this is established, you will need to collect evidence. Evidence is extremely important when it comes to litigation in China. And so you have different ways to uh, to collect evidence, but very important before starting a case to invest time, money, resources in building your case, which means collecting relevant and enforceable evidence of the infringements. Once that is done, then you have to devise your, your enforcement strategy. There are different ways and, and enforcement tools which are available. You have judicial enforcement, so going before the civil courts in China, you have criminal enforcement that may be av available, and you also have administrative enforcement, which can be uh, which can be useful and interesting. Administrative enforcement is usually used for clear cut cases, with the advantage of being uh, usually very fast, but not always easy to convince the administration to take the case. And 
you cannot collect damages. So you have different enforcement tools. Uh, if you opt for civil litigation uh, before going before Chinese courts, then key to have good evidence, key to work with good lawyers, and key to uh, file your action before the relevant courts. So you have um, you have um, uh, form shopping rules. Yeah, you can decide where before which court to file your action depending on where the infringer is located, depending on where the infringement takes place, you have rules uh, and you can play with that to select the, the, the best form possible uh, because you have judges that are more experienced than others to deal with specific IP matters. And so a lot of attention should also be given to selecting the right venue um before whom to to find your litigation and then well basically you 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 file a claim uh you exchange written submissions you make your arguments you plead your case and and, and then the court takes a decision uh, i think a huge advantage of litigation in china is that it is much faster than it can be uh especially in belgium unfortunately um but again, very important to have good rights, good evidence, select the right venue, work with the right lawyers to uh, to make it a success. But be aware that uh, IP litigation in China is, is extremely important. You have a lot of actions that are pending, that are being initiated uh, in China. You have specialized IP courts and IP judges that are extremely experienced. So you always should try to go before these kind of judges. But you have judges that handled two, three, four hundred patent litigation cases, for example. So they perfectly understand what a patent is, the value of a patent, and they render extremely good decisions. I sometimes play patent cases in Belgium and not always sure that the judge understand what a patent is. You can have that in China as well. Uh, but you do you do have extremely experienced judges as well. So uh, it can be a very good forum where to 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 litigate. And I would add that. When it comes to global uh, patent litigation wars, for example, when you have patent court cases pending in the US, in Europe, well, very often you have a court case pending in China because if you do your job correctly, well, the patent litigation system can be trusted and you can obtain very reliable decisions. So, um, yeah. Great. So we are actually running out of time. Last two questions for today. Um, the first one is, what are key considerations for Belgian universities collaborating with Chinese students? Um, and the second one is uh, to prevent export of counterfeits. Uh, China offers rights holders the possibility of registering IP rights uh, with uh, Chinese costumes. Uh, mm -hmm. Is this an effective measure in practice or not? Well, let's start with that one. Uh, it depends. Indeed, it's, it's an interesting feature and characteristic of the Chinese IP system is that you can block export. In Europe, you can block import at the custom, not the export. So that's positive. Um, but you need to um, you need to select what types of infringements you want to 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 have tackled at the at the customs. Patents difficult. Trademarks can work, um, but you need to, um, ideally, you need to, to know what um, export points will be uh, used by the infringer. You need to go on site. You need to train the custom so that they can identify an infringing products, etc. And you have a whole procedure that is in place to be able to, um, to use that characteristic. It can work, but you need to, to, to work with experienced Chinese IP lawyers that um that 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 master the system obviously but that, that i have also the good contacts with the customs and you need to invest in in training the customs. so obviously not possible to train customs all over china and that's why it's it's always good to understand what are the, the logistics of export of the counterfeits to really focus on the most relevant uh ports of of, of exports when it comes to universities and and students, well, that's that's a bit uh, a bit uh, tricky, I would say. Um, do do your background checks. Uh, don't be naive. Um, have strong contracts in place. 
monitor, uh, basically have a strong trade secret protection uh, regime in place, including cyber and IT measures, uh, organized trainings. Um, yeah, happy to, to discuss further in private, but uh, yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So I think there are no more questions, but I sent here on the chat box the dedicated helpline. So feel free to send uh, more questions to our uh, colleagues in uh, in China that will be very happy to answer you. So uh, to, for today, is um, I think uh, we provided all the key information. So I want to thank uh, again, Mr. Valentine de la Corte, for his presentation and Ms. Guan Song. And I also encourage everybody to be a member of the Flanders China Chamber of Commerce and the EU China Business Association. Um, so thank you very much and have a nice uh, day ahead. Well, thank you. Thank you all. And I can only uh, encourage as well uh, anyone based in Belgium to become part of the of EFCCC. Very valuable support. And also use obviously all the resources of the China IPSME help desk. The website is great, amazing, uh, accessible information on IP. Uh, and last but not least, I, I'm obviously available, so don't hesitate to uh, to reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.